Hello. Ah, sounds good. Sounds good. It's Friday, the end of the first week of classes. What more could we ask for? A beautiful day, some food, and a really nice seminar to start off our seminar series for this for this year. Uh, my name is Gene Giacomelli, and I'm the director of the Controlled Environment Agriculture Center, which is where this is being webcast from. We have people in the audience sitting in the room, and we have those out there that uh, hopefully can enjoy it from afar. Thank you very much for coming today and also everyone out, out there. Um, this is the first seminar of the Covering Environments for this academic year. There will be, the next one is September the 30th with uh, Dr. Leslie Gunatalaka from the Natural Products Center here at the University of Arizona. So that'll be Friday, September the 30th. I'll also announce this later when we, when we close. Um, Rafe Gruner has helped put this together all last year. And he's, even though he's in Czechoslovakia right now, somewhere in Europe, I better be careful, maybe not there. Um, Prague, OK, close enough. Czech Republic, yes, sorry. I just gave my age away. Apologize for that. Anyway, um, he's enjoying Europe uh, while he can, and then he's going to be back and operating all the remaining. So today I have to introduce, with great pleasure, Dr. Cherry Kubota. Um, Cherry is a professor in the uh, School of Plant Sciences in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences um, here at the University of Arizona. She is a member of the CEAC academic uh, faculty and has been here since 2003. 2002. 2002. Um, there's an extra year. Very good, yes. And um, she was uh, one of the first hires after I came here. And uh, we've had more since. And we're looking to more down, down the road. She um, uh, focuses on research and development and is a prolific publisher of her research work from her graduate students. Um, she teaches, teaches an online course. She teaches plant physiology of horticultural crops in greenhouses, focusing on the technologies. Um, because she is unique in having a horticultural engineering degree from Chiba University in Japan, which offered her the opportunity to not only learn about the biological aspects and the plant physiological aspects of growing crops, but also the engineering capability to design the systems to make that happen. And that's a great F1 hybrid to be, mm -hmm. particularly as a controlled environmental specialist. Thank you, uh, Cherry. Um, and I should mention that Chiba University is also well known for Dr. Toyoki Ko Kozai. Uh, who we could easily say has been in controlled environments, um, well, certainly well before Jerry. And yes, even, even before me, I learned from Kozai in about 1984 mm -hmm. uh, when he was a horticultural engineer working on greenhouses primarily. Of course, he's moved on now into indoor, multi-level, artificial lighted systems. So today, I'd like to introduce Terry Kubota. The title of her presentation has been on the screen for quite a bit of time here. But value-added food crops and transplants in controlled environment production. Terry, please. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jane, for really nice introduction. And I really thank everyone being here in late Friday afternoon um, listening to my talk. Um, I wanted to be part of the seminar. Um, Rafi is making a lot of effort, so I really appreciate um, this opportunity. So, um, so today's talk is focusing on the value-added uh, production using controlled environment technologies. This is one of the long-term topics I have been working for many, many years now because controlled environment can do that. And this is uh, quite exciting, again, to be able to talk about that. So um, I grew up in Tokyo and came to U.S. first time in 1994 as a postdoc. And then um, pretty much realized that um, 
uh, grocery store shopping is kind of depressing. <laughs> and um, now it's very different. You know, 20 years after that, um, I came um, 2002 again and started seeing the big difference, you know, almost exponential increase in development, diversification, and quality oriented marketing. So it's a very nice time to talk about quality. So, um, oops, click on that. Okay, so um, my mission here, I, I'm an applied plant physiologist. So I work on applied area. My mission in controlled environment agriculture research is basically um, developing science-based technology to help controlled environment agriculture industries and also ventures. Um, and then um, to do so, I basically translate scientific information and discoveries from basic side into the application to generate some inno innovative applications. So my style of research is pretty much problem solving. I can't just develop technology and think about application. I have to start with problem and then think about something I can help um, using scientific knowledge and technology. So that's what I do. So generally or naturally, my project is very diverse, um, not just one specific area, but I work on tomato, I, I work on um, strawberry as a new crop in greenhouse. I work on vertical farming. I work on vegetable seedling production, grafting. I work on LED lighting um, for supplemental lighting in greenhouse or indoor vertical farming. I work on mushroom as a new product. You know, I'm trying to uh, connect with um, uh, uh, mycologists in our school. Um, Barry Plyer, who actually gave a seminar, I believe, um, last year. Last semester? One year ago. OK. OK. So yeah, so I, I connect with many people and then utilize my capacity to, to make um, uh, meaningful projects. And then I even work with open field growers and scientists because I see that um, there's opportunity as um, controlled environment physiologists to work with them, sort of you know, interface area, connecting controlled environment technologies with open field traditional crop production technology. So that's what I do here. And then today, again, uh, talking about quality. So CEA technology, as many of you know, uh, we can um, produce um, uh, you know, the, um, a very good uh, yield. We can achieve very good yield, and then also high quality of produce. And you can minimize the resource relative to the outcome, so the efficiency is very high. And year-round production, um, therefore year-round uh, employment opportunities. So there are many, many good things of controlled environment. And um, I want to focus today uh, in one of the aspects, good aspects of controlled environment, which is again uh, high quality of the products. And then uh, typically. You know, the controlled environment um, ranges, technology-wise, ranges from low-tech, like a high tonal type of production system, all the way to high-tech, super high-tech, including uh, indoor production system, like a vertical farming. Um, in the past, relatively, I'm working on mid-tech to high-tech range, not so much about low-tech. But I, I tried to introduce high-tech again into the low-tech system, so that sort of hybrid um, uh, approach. But anyway, so I start with, um, in this seminar, I want to start with several sort of information slides um, telling you the current status of CEA industry and trend. And he, here is a, a slide showing the fresh tomato market or production in the US. Um, so the pie chart on your um, left hand side is basically showing the area distribution of uh, greenhouse in US um, for varieties of crop. As you know, tomato is a, a main crop grown in greenhouse. And right now it's 60%, which is a USDA statistics um, published last year, 2015. But if you look at the six years ago, USDA, you know, every six years or so, they, they publish the same type of information. Six years ago, tomato percentage was um, actually 70% or 75%, so much bigger percentage, you know, um, out of the CEA area in the US. The reason why is because other crops expanded 
um, herbs and lettuce and cucumbers. So those expand their, their food, uh, tomato um, relatively shrunk. And then another reason we know is increasing competition in tomato, fresh tomato market, because as right hand side um, uh, the chart shows, increasing almost linearly. The um, red line here is the greenhouse tomato imported to US. So that includes uh, uh, Mexican tomatoes and also Canadian tomato. And then we all know that Mexican tomato increase is dominating in, in, in this change. So that's why uh, market is more competitive. Therefore, greenhouse growers are not, no longer just tomato growers, but other crops um, uh, are grown in US um, greenhouses. Um, but yet, the entire CEA area is you know, expanding quite rapidly. Um, another reason um, doing this, again, is uh, um, basically strong support coming from retail and uh, uh, so the grocery stores and restaurants. Um, every single category is a crop, you know, the tomato and lettuce and cucumber. Um, if you looked at the number of operations in U.S., it's increased at least 50% all the way to 100 some percent. And basically for lettuce, for example, that's the fast growing sector in CEA industry, um, doubled the number of operations over the past six years. So it's very, very exciting. Um, so, so this is some of the personal observation uh, specific to tomato market. Uh, when I first came to U.S. 1990s, um, early 1990s, um, pretty much, um, you know, the tomato grown in, in greenhouse were um, beefsteak type. And then um, 2000s, diversification started. Um, partly because in increasing importation from Mexico, and Mexico quickly developed greenhouse you know, capacity. So now you can see cluster tomato, um, cherry and cocktail type, um, and then even heirloom tomato, which is a very low yielding variety, but very unique because of the flavor and shape, you know, very unique type. Um, those type of tomatoes are grown in, or started uh, being grown in greenhouse. And then um, in 2010, uh, to present, I, we finally started seeing more and more producers uh, focusing on flavor-based selection of cultivars and marketing. Um, and then organic hydroponics is also becoming uh, very special to add further value to the crop. So if you go to a grocery store, um, local, a grocery store, or anywhere in the U.S., you see many different greenhouse um, uh, tomatoes uh, marketed with the flavor, you know, the, the very nice flavor or, uh, um, or the taste or sweet. So that's the sort of catch um, copy or the, uh, the terminology they use in marketing. And then actually some of them are really good. I, I was very excited with one particular product. Um, very sweet, nice flavor. First time I felt, you know, okay, finally <laughs> I got this kind of quality coming up in the local supermarket. So anyway, so that's what is happening in tomato side. So other than tomato, finding some statistics specific to greenhouse is very challenging. So I had to, you know, so collect some information from USDA, some information um, that I had from a seed company. So this is a cucumber trend. I didn't know that. Um, now in U.S., 70% cucumbers are coming from either Canada or Mexico. Mexico, of course, contribution is huge. 20 years ago, it's only 40%. So the importation of cucumber increasing. And what's going in um, Mexico, basically increasing area of protected uh, cultivation of cucumber. And then they are producing either long English cucumbers or the mini cucumbers. So U.S. traditional cucumber type was lighter, so the dark skin color and very hard, so you have to peel the skin. Um, but the um, greenhouse kinds, like the long type English seedless one or the uh, mini, uh, you know, you, you don't need to peel because it's tender. And then also, um, uh, you know, it's crunchy. Um, and then particularly mini cucumbers do not have much water uh, like uh, long type. 
So it's very nice, and then that is exactly increasing uh, in greenhouse. So that's the trend right now going in cucumber, and then also reflecting, you know, uh, consumers supporting flavor for taste for better eating quality uh, in the fresh produce market. So lettuce and leafy greens, still 90% of leafy crop or lettuce are grown in open field, um, more than 90%. And as you all know, um, particularly if you live in Arizona, um, Arizona is the main uh, production site for the winter crop. So the during winter time, starting from end of November, probably to February or so, 90% of leafy crops, including lettuce, um, distributed in the U.S. Uh, come from um, Yuma area. So, um, so this is a typical, you know, open field um, uh, 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 production uh, of iceberg lettuce in Yuma. And then, um, and then uh, 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 these days, um, over the past years, increasing number of greenhouse production doing leafy um, uh, uh, lettuce you know, the loose leaf type or the baby leaf um, uh, uh, crop production. And then if you look at the flavor and eating quality of these uh, grown in greenhouse and then compare that uh, with the corresponding kind in open field, um, it's, it's very different, you know, distinct difference. Greenhouse grown leafy crops are generally more tender. And then you can actually send some level of sweetness to that. And then it's, it's really difficult to quantify the leafy crop flavor. We don't have any good um, index for that, but definitely you can tell the difference. Um, open field ones typically thicker, um, and then um, you, you, you have more crunchiness. But some, some kind of you know, um, leafy crops, such as iceberg lettuce or romaine, um, it probably makes sense to keep growing in the open field. The reason why is because that strategy, you know, growing a large head and then trimming down to the center core, which is crispy and white, and that is the part, you know, people tend to enjoy. So not necessarily sweetness, not necessarily flavor, but the crunchy texture. And then that kind of strategy may not work really well in greenhouse because it costs a lot more to grow them. And then it doesn't make sense to trim down the you know, very variable edible leaves out of, out of that, those head letters. Um, um, one of the things I, I, I heard um, among leafy green growers is they, that they are um, expecting leafy green greenhouse uh, production sort of following the past of uh, greenhouse tomato. So greenhouse tomato 30 years ago, 40 years ago, probably don't exist, didn't exist in the fresh market in the US, or its presence was very minimum. But now 40% minimum you can find in a grocery store um, coming from either Mexico or US, um, uh, you know, the greenhouse produce. Um, so that kind of thing, um, you may be able to see that in the leafy green um, uh, market in the future, or near future, I would say. All right, so this one is uh, just showing the um, open field romaine lettuce production, if you're not familiar with it. It's a big head, and then you basically trimming down probably more than half of the biomass to extract the variable. Um, romaine heart, and then, then that is the, uh, uh, the crop to distribute. All right, and then uh, because of the, um, you know, a good eating quality and freshness and tenderness and then all that good things, uh, this kind of greenhouse is uh, being built many places, uh, suburban area or uh, midtown area, uh, urban area um, in the U.S. It's, it's very exciting time. All right, and then another crop is strawberry, um, I'm telling you the opportunities. The strawberry, again, just like lettuce, 90% uh, or more, actually 99%, I would say, in open field. And then 90% of the available or the produced strawberries are coming from basically California. And then small percentage, maybe 7% or 8%. Um, do you have? Oh. 
but it shows it shows in here. Okay, do you wanna? Okay. So it stays in uh, the front slide. Yeah. So. Yeah. So. Um, strawberry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 90% coming from California and a little bit from Florida to fill the need in winter time. But Florida cannot produce enough. So there's a huge, you know, oscillation in terms of production that is translated into this price oscillation. So the January to December is the average price uh, over the three years. And then the high price basically start in November, December, um, uh, uh, January, February. And then by the time California starts producing massive amount of strawberries, the price goes down. So this is clearly showing there's an opportunity for us to invest a little bit more for the local off-season strawberry production, you know, appreciating high price value. Um, and then another important thing is U.S. strawberry breeding is pretty much developed to be able to ship long distance. So um, I show you the, uh, some of the technologies here. Host harvest technologies and variety selection, cultivar selection is very important for assure the quality for the long distance transportation. Takes four days, five days to get, you know, to get to the East Coast from California and then start setting that or distribute it in a distributed center. So there, there's a lot of investment going on in this technology, including um, forced air cooling and uh, um, what they call uh, modified atmosphere or controlled atmosphere packaging technology um, so that you know the respiration from the produce is suppressed, cold chain to make sure the food doesn't subject to the warm you know air temperature and then cultivar selection is always you know the high shelf life as priority, top priority. But if you are doing local production in greenhouse you probably don't need to worry about the shelf life, so um, you can select the flavorful um, varieties that may not have that shelf life. So here is my favorite equation, um, flavor equation. Um, you know, well, yeah, appreciating engineering education. <laughs> um, so I can express something using a quantitative approach, but flavor can be also you know, um, conceptually, yeah, equation, three variables. One is variety or cultivar, right? And then the second is environment. There's an interaction between those two. And then the third one is a human perception, liking factor, um, reflecting, I think, the cultural background and other things, age and gender, maybe. Um, so the three big uh, vari uh, variables. Do you want to check with this? Okay, yeah, okay. So um, usually what producers do, because there's not much information about environmental modification to change the flavor, um, uh, what they do is usually um, selecting varieties, selecting cultivars that achieve the sort of target flavor. But since there is an interaction between cultivar and environment, um, uh, assuring consistent quality, consistent eating quality and flavor is sometimes a bit more challenging. Okay, Dave, can you please? Oh, fixed. Oh, wonderful. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Um, um, so this is a, a cultivar comparison out of my program, strawberry program. The left hand side is Albion, U.S. Uh, variety. Right hand side is a new hole. <laughs> Sorry. Um, sorry, I yeah, so left hand side is RV and right side is new hole, Japanese variety. And typically Good flavoring varieties or cultivar is a low yielding cultivar. So um, as you can see, the BRICS is a good index for overall flavor. 
and then you can see that Albion is 9 in average, and Noho is nearly 11. And this huge difference, very sweet flavor. Um, yet, you have to look at this, the size difference and yield difference. So selecting good flavor variety is um, basically selecting low yielding variety. So that's the one thing. But growers decide to do that these days because, for example, fresh, fresh market tomato, it's so competitive. So instead of choosing high yielding uh, ordinary variety, they want to pick the uh, low yielding but extraordinary flavored variety. So that's what they are doing constantly in tomato world right now. So the tomato case, um, uh, this is uh, um, the summary for uh, different types of tomato, beef steak, POV, or cluster type, and cherry and grapes. And then fruit size decrease, um, you know, um, in, in this order. Oh, thank you. And then the bricks, when you get small size, you get higher value. So that's a sort of general information. And the smaller fruit um, uh, uh, cultivars, uh, like grapes and cherry, do not produce as much as POV or beef steak. So that's typical uh, we, we, we see in, uh, in uh, um, tomato. So my strategy here is um, instead of just relying on cultivar, um, I want to add the environment. So selecting environment that enhance the flavor of ordinary cultivars to achieve extraordinary flavor. So that's the strategy um, uh, we can do under controlled environment, not necessarily in the open field. So um, this is one of the earlier studies we did using tomato, cluster tomato, um, grown under two different uh, nutrient solution conditions. One is standard electric conductivity, which is basically the concentration of nutrient solution. And then the other one is doubled, so 2.4 versus 4.8 EC, so the higher EC. And then you can see that the bricks were 3.5 to 4.8. Um, during the experiment, um, when we grow them um, under standard low EC, but the, that bricks goes up to 4.8 to 6.1, and that is the range for cherry tomato. So now TOV cluster tomato, but having the cherry type of you know the condensed flavor, and then not just flavor. If you look at the surface, you know cut surface, um, uh, low EC tomato is more watery. And then the color is less dense. High EC tomato is very condensed. And the, this technique is because we are basically managing water allocation to the fruit. So uh, by putting high EC, giving osmotic stress and salt stress, and so they're limiting the water allocation to the fruit a little bit. So the size, you probably don't see, um, size of the fruit is slightly smaller in the high EC tomato compared to low EC tomato. And the uh, total yield, of course, is going to be lower, but maybe 5% to 10%. Uh, and then you can't really tell the stress level, uh, because tomatoes are relatively, you know, if you look at the plants, you can't tell which one is the low EC grown plant and which one is high EC grown plant, because that's very mild stress to the, to the tomato plants. Tomato is relatively tolerant um, in terms of soil stress compared to other greenhouse um, crops. OK, so this is another study done by um, one of my audio graduate students here, uh, Johan Bach. Uh, we did a cherry tomato study comparing, the um, again, high EC and low EC. And then he is showing consistently high uh, bricks, you know, the overall flavor under the high EC compared to low EC. And then again, high EC cherry tomatoes uh, had the bricks um, relative to or uh, uh, equivalent to the grape tomato bricks. So uh, that's, again, what I'm talking about, um, making um, ordinary cultivar to have um, extraordinary um, but I, uh, flavor. And then um, additional finding we had out of this project was lycopene enhancement and the high EC. So it's a stress response of the plant, so um, accumulating uh, phytochemicals, basically antioxidants 
in the food because of the osmotic stress, maybe salt stress. So my graduate student, um, uh, one of them, uh, Ming Wu, um, who got PhD at CAC uh, program, um, did this study and then confirmed that uh, lycopene accumulate um, uh, in the food. So this is a developmental stage, as you can see. Lycopene is the color, you know, the pigment, um, but good for human health and accumulate much faster under high EC compared to low EC. And then the ending level was 30% to 40%. Um, both as fresh rate level or fresh rate base or dry mass base. So that's a good additional bonus characteristic we can add uh, by growing plants, uh, tomato plants under high EC. And then we, whenever we try to develop a technology and demonstrate, we want to test that in a year-round production setting because that's what industry is doing. And therefore, we did this in, through the collaboration with a nutritional scientists. We wanted to test the tomato grown under high EC and low EC. But anyway, so this is a greenhouse microclimate uh, inside the greenhouse. So the light intensity per day, uh, we call DRI, daily light integral, uh, the basic cumulative light per day in the range of photosynthetic active radiation. And this is a daytime temperature. This is a nighttime temperature over the year of uh, production period. Um, lycopene is more following temperature. And then, of course, there is a distinct difference between high EC and low EC. Um, bricks is more following, um, or maybe both, following both light intensity and then also the temperature. So by doing this, we, we did a statistical analysis, multi-variable uh, analysis. So that statistical analysis can tell me which is the most important environmental factor factor affecting specific response, in this case, lycopene and bricks. And then that is eventually help um, engineers to develop the strategy in terms of controlling climate. So that's uh, what we did in uh, several years ago in this project. We also tested, you know, we, we love the salt application because we use the cheapest um, salt to increase the EC, so the sodium chloride. Um, and then we wanted to test in different crops, and this is uh, some of the um, responses we got out of leafy greens, leafy crop. So I had a collaboration with a former colleague in Yuma, Dr. Jorge Fonseca, um, and then his postdoc uh, working on salinity effect uh, in uh, lettuce, and then he grew this baby romaine lettuce, a quite wide range of salt um, concentration. And he found that uh, five millimol per liter, which is about 300 parts per million sodium chloride, um, they didn't see the yield decrease, yet 80% increase of beta carotene. So that's a good um, addition uh, or additional um, value to the uh, leafy crop, like uh, romaine, baby leaf. Um, and then also we did a similar study, but a little bit higher. Um, sodium chloride concentration, 17 millimole, which is like a 1,900 to 1,000, I forgot the exact number, um, parts per million of sodium chloride. And then we found a, a red leaf lettuce increased anthocyanin, so that purple pigment, by 30% by that. And an additional value um, we found was a salty flavor to the leafy crop. So that's a sort of, you know, the plants accumulate sodium, which is not too much, you know, compared to the daily allowance of sodium, it's very, very minor. But you can still sense the saltiness in the crop. And then that's exactly what you like in a salad. You add some kind of salty stuff, dressing or something, to enhance the overall flavor. And that naturally done, and this might be a good way to sort of distinguish um, that particular produce compared to other competitors' produce. So that's something I, I, I want to see in the future as application. Okay, so as I said, I, I work on LED and lighting technology, and this one is showing our early study using LEDs um, as supplemental lighting, but this study was looking at uh, phytochemical nutritional uh, 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 quality of the baby leaf lettuce with um, different light quality. So what we did was um, sort of vertical farming, growth chamber growing conditions. Main lighting was white fluorescent lamp. 
so the white broadband, white light. And then we added selected colors of supplemental lighting to see which compounds uh, in uh, uh, letters uh, was enhanced by that light quality. So we tested UVA, blue and green and red and infrared. Um, every single treatment has exactly the same PAR, so the photosynthetic active radiation was exactly the same, but more blue or more green or more red or additional UVA or additional infrared, because UVA and infrared are outside of the PAR. But anyway, so as you can see, anthocyanin and carotenoids uh, were enhanced by adding UVA or blue. So the implant side, um, UVA and blue basically perceived by the same photoreceptor, so the, uh, sort of the similar, you know, as we expected, similar response was obtained by those two lights or light qualities. Green didn't do anything. Um, this is, again, a comparison with the, the white light control. So having plus number is by supplemental lighting, you get increased of that much um, compared to the white light control. And green didn't do anything, so the all non-significant. And then the red increased the phenolics. And then the it was interesting. It increased the biomass quite a bit, 30%. And this one was probably most likely the morphological effect. So the farad enhanced the leaf expansion. So plants from the early stage had much bigger leaf area, so capturing more light and then capturing energy to build uh, biomass. So that's why uh, forest actually enhanced the biomass. Yet, because of the quick growth, it's a dilution going on. And then therefore, anthocyanin, carotenoid, chlorophyll all declined compared to white light control. So we thought this is interesting. We found light quality that enhanced biomass but reduced the phytochemicals. We found light qualities that enhance phytochemicals but not doing anything on the biomass. So what if we combine those two? So the next experiment we did, which we haven't published yet, unfortunately, but we did a combination of the two. So the blue or farad and blue and farad alternating way. So the one day under blue enhanced light quality, one day uh, under the farad enhanced light quality. We did that way because of the technical reason. But it's interesting, we maintained the biomass increase, yet recovered the phytochemicals to the level equivalent to white control. So there's no more reduction, like a big reduction like farad only treatment. So this is a great demonstration you know, the selecting environment, selecting the controlled environment strategies to be able to induce the targeted response from the plants. In this case, biomass uh, increase and then also uh, nutrient um, enhancement. All right, so this is more recent data. Um, undergraduate student uh, Alex Schaller did this microgreen study. He selected three different microgreens. Um, and then grow them, grew them under um, four or five different light qualities, um, all LEDs. Well, one of them was actually quite fluorescent now. But this one is a, um, a basically a, a good experiment to confirm us that um, flavor and nutritional compounds, the response of those are basically uh, species and cultivar specific. Uh, and then also another thing is that because of the human perception and then also liking, um, it's not necessarily the same light environment uh, work for every single different microgreen. So here is two example. I have Korean perera or whatever you pronounce, which is a difficult one for me to pronounce. Um, so that um, uh, microgreen, um, uh, it's very strong flavor. And we had a two um, um, uh, light environments um, which had two different light levels, but the total energy is the same. So we call DRI. So one is a low light but longer hours of lighting. The other one is high light but short um, lighting period. So the biomass at the end was the same between those two treatments. But the people's, I mean, he did a, a basically taste testing with selected number of people. Um, but case testing results supported that low light grown Pereira was much better because high light grown one is too strong. Um, in contrast, 
um, cabbage, brassica, um, the highlight grown one is much better lighting score um, compared to low light because people appreciate, they, they know this flavor, they, they, they know exactly what to expect, therefore um, the strong flavor was appreciated. So that's sort of, you know, one example he um, confirmed the, the human factor in that um, uh, flavor equation. And then another um, finding he had was uh, increasing blue light composition in the light quality enhanced the anthocyanin. It's sort of basically made or uh, agreement with my earlier study with the leafy, leafy lettuce. Okay, so that's basically the food crop talk. I'm switching my gear to the transplant talk, maybe 10 more minutes or so, um, five more minutes. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so the transplants, you're not eating them, so that the quality, <laughs> quality uh, parameters are totally different. You have to look at the morphology, you have to grow very strong plants, because transplants sometimes go to a harsh environment, they have to survive really well, grow fast, and then uh, free from pest and disease. Um, another interesting thing is some transplants, we want to induce flowers before going into the field. Those are floriculture species, including vegetables, maybe, and berries. You want to make sure of our initials there before going into the field. And the other application may be suppressing flowers, which is not so common in terms of technology, but I'd like to show you how it works uh, because it's very neat technology. So the indoor transplant production technologies, um, I was part of the team uh, led by uh, Dr. Kozai, Toyoki Kozai in Chiba University many years ago, and we contributed a lot to develop the basic technologies of indoor transplant production, multi shelving system, and then that technology basically became the base of the vertical farming concept. Um, the good thing of that is the high transplant production, um, it's a short period of time. And it's, if you do that in greenhouse, it's pretty much affected by the weather, you know, the sunny day, cloudy day, high temperature, low temperature, that affects the plant quality. But indoor production, you can produce consistent high quality. Um, and then also, um, you can create the environment to induce flowers or suppress flowers. So that's really good thing. And then another thing is, you always worry about cost, but it's a high density production of value Crop. For example, grafted plants, probably somewhere between 40 cents a plant all the way to a dollar per plant. And then you are growing hundreds of plants in, 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 in a limited area. So that the cost for electricity, for example, is very minimum, sometimes less than one cent. So, so that's why it it's quickly became a standard technology. So um, in terms of flowering control, um, the big application I can think of, you know, indoor transplant production is the floriculture um, uh, area. Uh, just wanted to remind um, food crop production in greenhouse is, is, uh, is a still a small percentage compared to floriculture. Those are all floriculture applications, so the areas of greenhouse in U.S. And then the biggest one is the annual bedding plant. And then uh, now this sector actually started um, looking at the indoor production of transplants or plugs, and then that's it's quite unique um, uh, 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 technology uh, uh, in, in the near future. And then I'll show you one example, and that's the only example coming from the floriculture non-edible crop. <laughs> I just need to check. <laughs> but anyway, so th th this is, um, um, again, earlier study, when we were developing indoor transplant production technologies back in Japan in 90s and early 2000s, um, this is the pansy production, flag production. The pansy is basically in Japan, and maybe in the U.S. in this area, it's a winter garden plant. You want to plant the pot plants, you know, the liners, um, maybe October, November time period. And then the flower continue over the winter time, and then that's really nice. But to do that, the growers need to start the plugs in the middle of summer. In summertime, pansy production is a lot of pain. They get stretched and they don't survive really well and it's so weak and not creating good, you know, planting material. So the collaboration with the company 
called Taiyo Kogyo, Kozai's team, worked on this. And kanji flag grown indoor, vertical farming situation, 20 degrees C, which is 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, um, the constant light intensity, I believe it was like a 300 micromoles. Um, 12 hours photo period, and look at the quality of the plant. Very nice compact compared to greenhouse grown. Greenhouse, you get 40 degrees, 100 degrees in midday because it's the middle of summer. So the plants stretched and not developing much root. And then when you transplant them to develop uh, or finishing as liners or pot plants, then you see the flower, a lot more flowers, and then also consistent flower development when you grow them. Uh, the plugs in the indoor. So that is a great potential, um, you know, particularly summertime floriculture bedding plant um, production. And by the way, the, the difference, I think, um, I, I believe there was a seven day difference in terms of flowering. Um, that is huge. Okay, so um, similar technology but suppressing flower. So this is um, uh, probably new to you, but it's very exciting technology. Um, so the leafy green production, um, summertime production is also very challenging. You know, um, when greenhouse temperature is too high, uh, it's very difficult because you get bolting, maybe tip pan in summer because um, basically bolting is coming from the long day and high temperature. Um, and then the same thing happening for uh, not just lettuce, but spinach and arugula, so those are also sensitive to temperature or day lengths. So this is a kind of boarding you know, table, but very exciting concept. So the Chan Fu Chan, who was my former colleague at Chiba University, um, did this series of studies, nice study using spinach plug production in the indoor compared to greenhouse for the summertime spinach production in the greenhouse. So the spinach, varieties of spinach, uh, well, the spinach uh, basically get bolted, you know, the, the flower stalks that extend it um, under the long day, and then that response is accelerated when temperature is high. So what he did, and then I, I, I had a privilege to be a co-author for this study, but what he did was comparing indoor conditions, relatively short day, and then grow the plants you know, the seedlings up to 14 days, um, and then compare the greenhouse grown spinach, same duration, but natural day lengths during summertime is 15 hours. And then he demonstrated that the bolting after transplanted in the greenhouse, which is long day condition in the greenhouse, 90% bolted. So the bolting deteriorate not just the uh, visual quality, and then also flavor you know, the, the bitter uh, uh, principles, you know, the basic compounds accumulate. So it's very, very bad. But indoor plants suppressed enough for this baby spinach production um, up to the harvesting four weeks later of transplanting. So, you know, the spinach day is a bolting resistant varieties, but the reason they did in this study was bolting sensitive varieties are typically I don't know in the US situation, but back there, bolting sensitive varieties are typically flavorful varieties. And then uh, customers or consumers want to grow them in summer if possible. But because it's challenging in summer, they have to switch the varieties to bolting resistant variety, which is not necessarily the best quality spinach for salad. So that's what they did. And then he was doing a series of studies after that, and it was a great inspiration to my study, which finally um, realized um, last year, or a couple of years ago, at the first trial. So in Yuma, iceberg lettuce production, um, you as uh, the iceberg lettuce production, you know, the main site is California, Salinas Valley. Um, and then winter time is in uh, Yuma area, but the industry need to have a transitional area between Salinas Valley and Yuma, because Yuma cannot produce, um, you know, uh, long enough into uh, 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 in the fall time, and then Arizona cannot start producing or harvesting iceberg lettuce um, until December or so, or late November. 
So there's a transitional site always involved. And then the transitional site is a, a central valley, so the water issue is huge. So industry wants to either extend the Salinas Valley production or bring the Arizona production much earlier. Um, why we can't start early production in the fall in Arizona is because of the temperature. The lettuce voting is very sensitive to the heat. And cumulative heat is one of the sort of variable. We um, estimate the timing of voting. And if you look at the, um, uh, this is from August 15th to the end of the year. And this is a, a daily heat unit, so the cumulative temperature. It's, you know, the initial uh, two months or three months or so, it's very, very high temperature. You know, Yuma, August and September, it's very, very hot. So they, they don't want to see it in the middle of the high heat uh, months because it, it's going to boil. Um, and then also, they are doing um, a direct seeding in the field in a such harsh environment, so they have to put maybe 10 or 20 more seeds in the field than necessity. And then they have to send the uh, basically manual labor workers to you know send the plants to establish the final. Still, they have you know not 100% establishment, and that's a big issue in the Yuma production. So my sort of approach uh, presented and um, cut Noti from Yuma um, collaborated with me was using transplants, but grown in a cooler climate in the indoor production. Um, so instead of having that high heat unit um, uh, many months or, or the, the couple of months or so, um, we want to grow seedlings under a uh, cool climate and then transplant them into the um, field. And the first study we did a seeding day um, mid-August, August 15. Um, in, 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 in a controlled environment conditions and then also in an open field direct seeding. And then this is the, the head that is, we have as the early November. And you can see that it's, it's extensive voting in the direct seed that um, let us head. This is no marketable, but um, um, transplanted ones. Are still, you know, the initial stage of voting, so it's not perfect uh, condition or perfect technology yet. But you can see that huge difference you know, at the, at the time of harvest. So this is something I think, you know, the interface area, uh, controlled environment technologies can help conventional uh, open field production. So the basically uh, marriage between high tech and low tech. So that's something I want to see. And to be honest, I like to see something like that in five years in Yuma. You know, this is a letter seedling production facility actually used in the Netherlands, so the Dutch system, using LEDs, multi shelving in a warehouse. And those are actually used in a greenhouse, not in the open field. But I like to see that in Yuma or somewhere nearby in producing high quality seedling to support Yuma open field production. Um, maybe more practical idea or the, the approach is selecting a, a site or location which you can achieve relatively low temperature, but the challenge is that consistency of that temperature during summer is, is, a, is a problem. In, ha in fact, we did select the Prescott area uh, last year, but the temperature was not as cool as we hoped. So we had a lot of voting of those um, uh, transplants came from Prescott area also. But anyway, so those things are sort of um, uh, what I'm talking about. Um, so as a conclusion, um, uh, CEA crop production is expanding. And because of the, you know, basically we appreciate quality coming out from CEA. And then the, um, we can enhance or add uh, additional value or specific quality traits to the product in a controlled environment. And I show the overall flavor can be enhanced. Uh, or health promoting phytochemicals can be enhanced and flower initiation can be assured or suppressed, you know, those things I showed. And morphology, which I didn't show much in this seminar, but it can be controlled, you know, stretch the stem or make the plants more compact, you can do that by controlled environment. And some of the technologies I showed today is very feasible, particularly like EC, you know, the manipulation of EC is not really 
um, difficult. So it's very feasible and actually practiced in many uh, industries um, uh, uh, out there now. Um, not so much in U.S., I, I guess. Um, and flowering control is very interesting, particularly for transplanting or transplant production stage. And then I would like to see more research in this area, floriculture crop applications and vegetable crop application. Um, it's very unique technology. And then the um, morphological response and uh, biochemical response we found very um, species or cultivar specific. So we need to do a lot more work to find out each cultivar's response. And then um, I hope to find a sort of versatile uh, environment at the end. Otherwise, it's going to be a, a little bit too much of a headache. But anyway, so that's exciting area. And then I'd like to acknowledge many um, uh, collaborators, including um, uh, Cindy Thompson from Nutritional Science and Jorge Fonseca, now FAO, Rome in Italy, uh, Kat Norti Yuma Agusena, Toyoki Kozai, my mentor and a former boss, and Chang Hu Zhong, my collaborator and friend, and uh, all the members from my lab and funding agents, uh, USDA and some other. Uh, and then, of course, DEAC, having me for the past 15 years, which was great. Um, and then I have, you know, now website and Facebook if you are interested to get connected with me. I upload a recent, you know, scientific information or what's going on. So thank you so much for um, having um, time with me here listening to my talk. Thank you. Great, Sherry. Thank you. Thank you. That will be some time for questions. Thank you for the talk. Very, very, very interesting. Uh, I have a question related to the EC. That's basically salinity, right? That's right. Uh, since that increases you, increases flavor, have you considered or thought in using diluted seawater to feed the plant? Yeah, but seawater EC is way higher. Right, but diluted, I mean. Yeah, you can dilute. Yeah, but. Um, Basically, um, you need to dilute many, many times. What, what, is, what is one of the main issues that gonna, humanity is going to face in the, yeah. in the next yeah. you know, decade? Yeah. Yeah. And also, it's rich in nutrients, and right. maybe right. that will be a, a solution to enhance Yeah, yeah. so I, I think that's also possible. So there is a multiple seawater greenhouse projects. Um, and seawater used for basically the source water for cooling and then extract uh, fresh water out of that. And maybe some of the seawater can be used for directly feeding, not as, as it is, but dilute it. So I, I think that's possible. Mura, you have related comments? Oh, OK. Um, I just have a comment about also the EC experiments. The, the first one you talked about was done with the tomatoes, mm -hmm. and you were talking about uh, micro semens. You yeah. were given a unit, and then you went into an experiment with lettuce and also salt related stresses, yeah. Yeah. and you switched to quantitatively talking about. You so didn't you use EC yeah. anymore. Yeah, yeah, you started yeah, yeah. talking about milligrams. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Why, why do you do that? Why did I do that? Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. Why don't you just make it all one? Yeah, yeah. So the the lettuce, yeah. So the lettuce part, the seventeen millimole. Let me go back because this one I don't remember. Um, it's just the I guess the flow of the talk. I switched because of the um, uh, this particular study was not. He, he sees the result, but he was looking at specific sodium uh, concentration to the response. Um, of the leafy crop, so that's why 17. But the EC level of this um, experiment in, done in our greenhouse was about 4.5 um, to 5 uh, millisiemens per, per uh, centimeter, or decisiemens per meter. So it's equivalent to the tomato level. Right. So for yeah. comparison, I think it would be nice to see that EC I agree. on the presentation. Yeah. yeah, particularly for those who are not really familiar with the conversion. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good point. 
and also the uh, the light quality one. Yeah. You said that the micro moles were all the same for all of the light. Mm -hmm. Just the qual the quality change. Right. Okay. Right. Otherwise, you don't you don't see that consistent biomass. So so if you increase the micro moles, then you you get more biomass. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So that's what we call fair comparison. There's an online question yes. about sodium chloride. Is that the only salt you can use? No, you can you effect? can increase you can increase all the nutrients um, in the solution to get the high EC, and you probably get the same response. Not the salty flavor though, but um, for the for the um, a bricks increase in tomato, um, you can achieve high EC by increase the concentrations of the salts. Um, we did that by adding sodium chloride because it's the cheapest salt. Um, you can do that, maybe potassium chloride or something, uh, but why not, you know, wh why not cheapest option? So that's why we did sodium chloride. Sure. I want to follow up on the salinity again, on the flavor. So you described uh, about using sodium chloride and salinity to improve the flavor, then you also talk about the light quality yeah. to achieve the same thing, mostly yeah. in the vertical farm systems. Yeah. Do you see applications of salinity in the vertical farm systems compared to LED light quality oh, yeah. in terms oh, yeah. of the cost as well as? Yeah, um, yeah definitely. Okay. Yeah. How about the integration of the two in terms of cost and maybe practicality? Is it practiced both salinity and light quality? I think salinity is way cheaper. Cheaper than light quality light application, quality. yeah, uh, and then you can you can easily, you know, do that without changing your system, existing system. Okay, thank you. Um, I had a question about Alex's study. Did he look at any other stressors on it, or did he only deal with the different types of light? Yeah, I only, he, he did only the light quality. Only the light. Yeah. So kind of what um, he was just saying, like it wouldn't. It, couldn't it be possible that to just increase the EC in order to get that taste change? The to yeah, to you are the right on. That's what I was thinking too. Um, but you know, the the baby microgreens so the roots are so tender. Yeah, the, the, they may be more sensitive to the EC change. But I haven't tested that, so I'd like to see if I can actually create. My personal interest is creating microgreens having good, you know, the the bitterness and flavor and little bit of salt in it. So that's something I, I want to see. Because you, you, you use as garnish, you're adding them. You, you don't eat microgreen as they are. So it's almost flavor addition. Terry, thank you for such a uh, fascinating uh, presentation. Uh, my question is not about uh, any of your studies, but it's a term that you mentioned in the introduction about uh, organic hydroponics. Yeah. If you could tell us, please, about the current thinking on that. Um, I want to direct that question to Stacy, who is actually in the committee um, okay. um, discussing the um, organic status of, well, you can go ahead. Were, were you saying just where are things at with organic hydroponics right now and certification and definition? Oh, that's a good one. Um, well. <laughs> I was on the um, organic and the organic hydroponic and aquaponic task force for the USDA concerning certification, and we just wrapped up our report, and the report is public now, um, and so it gives more information about what's happening in the industry as far as organic hydroponics goes, and how it aligns and does not align with current regulations. So now it's going to be up to the National Organic Standards Board to take our information and make a decision to then go to the higher full USDA to perhaps make regulation change. Um, but right now it's it's still po it's still possible to get certified with certain uh, organic hydroponic systems. Some certifiers will do it and some won't so we're trying to uh, USDA is trying to make it all standard now and clear up the regulation. so it's still in process. November, in November, they're having another meeting of the NOSB, and they're supposed to make a decision at that point. Oh, good. Good to know. Yeah, if there's interest, we may do a entire presentation about this, have a yeah. roundtable discussion. Yeah. There's going to be a lot of, a lot of yeah. discussion going on. Yeah. 
uh, doctor on on the work with the uh, uh, the dimple variety of the spinach uh, um, with that work. Did they have a full set of of, of complementary treatments in each case with the out uh, the uh, greenhouse versus the controlled environment? For example, the indoor at 15 hours was not a treatment. Yeah, did, that, did you just extract? What, yeah. What the well, no. The the first set was the sort of proof of concept I showed. And then in a series of experiments followed, um, Chang Hu-Jong presented uh, multiple ones afterwards. And that included 15 hours of photo period in the indoor condition. And that basically initiated voting. So that photo period in the indoor condition is, has to be short for the spinach um, to be able to produce in a greenhouse without causing too much voting. So I was wondering if, if that was affected to the quality of light or just the length. Inside. The lens, yeah, the, the lens, yeah, yeah. I guess I'll stay inside more. Thank you. There, there is also a question online about whether this will be available afterwards, and it will. We will be able to put this up on online so others who couldn't be here today sure. yeah. could see this presentation. Um, one more, one more question. Would you mind going back to the slide where you present, where you have the table with the light, um, light influence on biomass? And, yeah. Oh, this one? Yeah. I think it's that one. So you see, so UVA seems to have positive blue yeah. and far red. Now, far, is far red like infrared kind of? Far red is uh, um, 700 to 800 nanometers. Does so, it? That's, that's a sort of still the visible radiation range, but outside of PAR. Right. So the photosynthetic light, non-photosynthetic light. Does that increase temperature of the environment? Because uh, infrared is generally related to temperature. Well, not as much as actual near infrared, which is from 800 to 2,000 nanometers. So did, did, have you checked the temperature of your... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So the old temperature yeah. is pretty cool. In my group, we pay a lot of attention in the leaf temperature and microclimate. And every single treatment has a sensor okay. so that we make sure the, the fair comparison is done. And I think uh, we, we do right away. Okay. So we, we are confident. It was, yeah, my <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. There was another question online that might be difficult for me to interpret and ask. Okay. Um, and it's getting late, but let's see if we can do it because I know you're good at this. And it has something to do with photosynthesis, uh -huh. the plant response at the different frequency, different colors of the uh -huh. light and wavelengths. But you were doing the experiment. You said it's an equivalent DLI, yeah. total yeah. energy. Yeah. No. Total, total photosynthetic of radiation, yeah, moles yeah, of light. Yeah, but those moles came from different wavelengths. Right, exactly. And there's the question basically is asking: Is that a fair comparison? I guess. Oh yeah. So so we looked at the biomass because it responds differently. Yeah. So so they they expect sort of what we call McCree curve response. So the red light is the most efficient light. So the you might have more biomass accumulation and the red enhanced light quality versus blue enhanced light quality. But my study, because this is a dense plant production, the baby leaf production, as you can see that. So basically, the total uh, PAR um, determines the biomass, not the leaf based response, the total. So um, as you can see, the biomass was equal up to um, red. And then far red, uh, because of the morphological factor, um, it was enhanced. Morphological meaning yeah. that the leaves Expanding. expanded much more right, quickly right. than the right. others. That's Therefore, right. they intercepted more of the light right, exactly. in the early stages exactly. and could grow more. Yeah. But they, you said the word before, they got diluted anyway. Yeah, so, the, yeah so those uh, yeah. phytochemicals reduced. So we won, but we lost. Right, right. Wait a wanted to build up on that. So was that dilution factor because of the lack of nutrients in the environment or was uh, other I other think it's causes? a faster growth. Yeah. Yeah. Faster growth. Okay. And nutrient-wise, we, we add with nutrient solution. I don't think it's 
lacking. On the next slide, could you show where you mix the? Yeah. Uh, the, okay. In, yeah. in, in, in uh, that case, you had one day with blue and then yeah. one day with fluorine. Right. And, and the blue alone was shut off at the same time that there was no, when the far red was on the other one, is that correct? Or was it constant blue and constant far red on the blue? Oh, no, no. That's, so, so basically, we had a two sets of environmental um, conditions. And then my student was basically <laughs> moving plants from one to the other because we didn't have the light lighting system having both blue and violet at that light intensity. So it was challenging for us to do this, but the only way we could do that was a swapping. Sure. And so they all got the back. same amount of light. It's just the Yeah, the same pa again. The same blue and the same yeah. far red. It's just that you switched. Yeah, that's right. In total. Right? Exactly. Exactly. The beauty of all of this is is that with LEDs there's now the opportunity to right. create a formulation right. of light like right. The soil scientists did for us, and the plant scientists many years with different nutrition. Oh, sure, yeah. Right? The yeah. nutrition formulation yeah. for every yeah. type of plant, yeah. maybe every cultivar. Yeah. But I think in the end, uh, we sort of narrowed down to several selected a few. recipes. A few. Yeah, a few selected recipes rather than zillions of optimized light qualities. Yeah, but there will always be those out there that I have yeah. a better way because. Yeah. I'm tweaking this, right, Pat? We know that, yeah, that 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 goes that way. I did I hear you say that maybe we ought to go back to white light and just yeah, cover the, it? yeah. The, in Carrie Mitchell from Purdue always say we are rediscovering white light. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the value of white light. Yeah. So, any last brief question? Wow. Let me come up here. Hear, hearing none, then we really want to thank. Dr. Cherry Kubota oh, thank you for very everything much. that she's thank done you, thank you. and all the work she's done. You can see that. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll end with um, a reminder that we come back here in about four weeks on September the 30th, which is a Friday again, and we'll have um, Leslie Gunatalaka from the Natural Products Center will be making a presentation here. And then in October, we have a very special guest, Dr. Andrew Weil will be here to speak about um, his uh, nutrition and you know he's a doctor and he's a, he's a lecturer and he's well known around here and we have a great opportunity to bring him in. So we'll see you in two months in October with Dr. Andrew Weil. Having said all that, if there's no more nothing, it's Friday, let's go enjoy the weekend. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Jane.